Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to, to help come in, um, celebrate the opening of this new center. What I thought I'd do today is um, reflect a little bit about my career in the semiconductor industry, which um, focuses, covers basically the same time frame as Dottie. I um, started designing integrated circuits in 1978, um, and all I have to say, it's been quite a ride. But as a result of that, I've come to the conclusion that we really need to change the way we think about digital system design because the technology that we're using is really going, undergoing some fundamental changes. And I'll try to explain those thoughts with you today. When I started this whole um, design thing, I, I think I, I ended up in the golden age, at least from a technology perspective, because we got what I call scaling's triple play. And this was pointed out by Bob Denard back in 1974, that if you take a MOS device and you scale all its sizes, okay, and the voltage, you get obviously more devices. If you scale the devices by 2x in every dimension, you now can put four times as many devices in the same silicon space. Okay, by scaling both the voltages and the sizes, the devices go faster, so your gates go twice as fast. But most importantly, the energy that's consumed every time a gate evaluates goes down by a factor of eight. This is perfect because if you think about it, within the same area, I can do eight times as many gate evaluations per second. I have four times as the gates. They run twice as fast. And the energy consumed by each of those evaluations goes down by a factor of eight. So the power remains constant even though I'm doing eight times as much work. And of course, it was architects and other kinds of system designers who leverage this increasing power to basically build better stuff and make our system smaller and faster. Unfortunately, the situation is very different today. Devices are still scaling down in size, so we're still scaling technology at least for another decade and probably farther than that. And we're doing that because it makes the devices cheaper to build or at least the functions that we want cheaper. But unfortunately, for various physical reasons that I won't bore you by, uh, voltages are no longer scaling down as rapidly. And that means that the assumed, and some of the dimensions are scaling as well, which means that the assumed improvement in device performance and energy per switch are no longer improving. And in fact, I like to think about it today as devices are getting faster by magic and more magic. First, we squeeze the transistors. How you squeeze something that's so small, I don't quite understand, but they managed to do it. And now we're building three-dimensional structures in the, in the tri-gates. And this is all to try to build these small transistors that have high performance. And those guys are wizards, and I'm not going to say they're not going to do it. But it doesn't have the benefit that it used to have before. So anytime you talk about a technology, we talk about the end of that technology. Everybody talks about, well, what about technology X? And I don't know what your X is. There's lots of them out there from quantum kind of devices to bio devices and everything else. You know, after all, the first computers were mechanical. And this is actually a photograph of the difference engine, Babbage's difference engine, because I live in the Bay Area. If you ever visit, you have to see it. It is the most amazing contraption that I've ever seen. It's great. Um, but of course, we move from mechanical machines to electrical machines. This is a photograph of the ENIAC, which is one of the first computers. Use tubes. Well, that was more energy efficient than the mechanical systems, but you know, tubes are not known for their energy efficiency or the reliability. From there, from tubes, we built transistors. The top is one of the first transistors that were built. The picture below it is the transistor one that was built at Manchester. This is in the late 50s. Pretty soon after we build transistors, we had planar integrated circuits. And that's a, actually a bipolar uh, simple gate, one of the first planar ICs. Of course, from bipolar integrated circuits, we moved, because of power reasons and density reasons, to MOS devices. This is probably one of the most important integrated circuits ever produced. This is the 8086, done in NMOS, if I remember correctly. H NMOS, the high performance NMOS in Intel. The developed. 
And then, of course, Enlaw started running into power problems that meets the ungodly power dissipation of 5 watts or 6 watts. I don't know how many people are old enough to remember these times. But, um, and we couldn't stand having parts dissipate 6 watts or 10 watts, I think. A deck did a 10 watt part. Um, so we moved to CMOS, which brought it back under. This is the 68020. So of course, if CMOS is having problems, there must be some technology X that's going to save our bacon. Or maybe that's not a good expression in Israel, actually. So I apologize. Um, but unfortunately for computing, I don't believe any alternative technology is really going to help us out. If you think about what the fundamental issues that we're trying to, um, that we're limited by in CMOS scaling, they have to do with fundamental physics of having single charge carriers <laughs> overcoming a potential barrier. Um, and the energy that's dissipated is by basically doing voltage level signaling. So if you don't want to have these problems, you have to have your charge carriers not have a single charge or not be charge based or not do voltage signaling. And as far as I know, there aren't any potential signaling schemes that basically match both of that, that fix both of those problems. Okay? And if we did fix those problems, and you know, after all, there is a machine in our heads which does computing in some ways. It doesn't have these problems, and I know some about the fundamental physics there, and it's really interesting. Um, they're very different from the way we think about computing today. And what I've learned by starting a company 20 years ago is the saying that if you build it, they will come is completely and totally bogus. If you build it, they do not come. They only come if they absolutely positively have to. Okay? So one of the rules in a startup is if you're going to do something in a startup, you can't do something better than somebody else. You have to do something that nobody else can do. Because from their perspective, why should they bet their business on you? Because you're the startup that's probably flaky and probably going to fail. They're only going to bet on you if you provide them something that they cannot get a different way. Now, if you think about computing, we actually have a pretty good base technology today. Worse yet, it has defined the way we think about everything. Right? Why do we have binary signals? Right? Biology doesn't have, I mean, digital, we, I, I think we have to have digital. But in biological systems, you have binary <coughs> signals right? in DNA. Binary, we have binary because that's what was useful for us in electronic systems. Why do we have distinct memory from logic? Why do we think about hierarchical partitioning? It all has to do with relatively planar interconnect. I mean, I could go on and on about why we did these things for good reasons, but it had to do with the constraints of the technologies that we were using. If you find some other technology that really gets around to fundamental problems, it won't obey any of these constraints, and it's going to be weird. And that means you're going to have to reconstruct the entire stack, not just the underlying technology to use, that tech to, to use it, and that, my friends, is a huge investment. And they're going to look at that versus looking at using the technology that now can build you a billion or 10 billion transistors. Each transistor costs almost nothing. And they'll say, eh, I think I'll use this. So I don't think any frontal assault on computing by a different technology is going to be successful. So what does that mean? I believe, at least from a computing perspective, our, our Future is in silicon. <coughs> now that does not mean I do not believe there's that does not mean that technology is dead. I think there's tremendously interesting technologies to be invented. And in fact, I think today is one of the most interesting times from a device and technology perspective. But I think you should focus those devices on things other than computing, because you need to find a niche that you can basically grow that technology up so you have sufficient engineering to make it competitive in something else. And there are many potential and interesting new technologies. And again, we can, that's a different talk, but we can talk about it as well. If our, if our future is in silicon, what do I think are going to be the most important and most interesting areas? Well, the first is essentially what Dottie said. Today, we have this technology that is incredibly powerful. I mean, I'm old enough to be completely amazed that you can get uh, you can uh, manufacture a computer in a complete network system for under a buck. Okay. They might not sell it to you for under a buck, but it costs less than a buck for them to manufacture. And so now the question is, what can you build that will save the world, improve the world, by adding a little competition? Okay. This, I think, 
think for the next couple decades is going to be one of the critical problems in computer systems. And the interesting challenge there is that the people who understand what the problems are that need to be solved are not the people who understand what the technology can do. Or the people who understand the problems don't even know that they could actually use the technology. And bridging that gap is going to be an incredibly important problem. The other area is the problem of continuing to scale computing performance. And as Dottie mentioned, this is all about energy efficiency, and so we're going to have to be able to build more efficient computing systems. And I think to solve both of these problems, we're going to have to dramatically change the way we think about design. Now, I'm going to focus mostly in the rest of this talk on the second bullet, but I think the first bullet is just as important and basically can use similar kinds of solutions. So since I'm going to focus on energy efficiency, what I'd like to do is a brief tutorial about energy efficiency and how you get it. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my basic idea for getting energy efficiency, which, basic, which requires customization, which basically requires us to change our design processes because design is too expensive today. And then I'm going to just tantalize you with a few results from my research group that indicate that I'm not completely free. Okay, so this is one of my favorite plots. So what I've shown here is on the vertical axis is the energy it takes to do an operation. In this case, to do a spec mark. Okay, versus the peak performance of the machine in spec marks. Now what's unique about this plot is I've actually normalized all the computers from, from the past 20 years, all the CMOS microprocessors, so that they use effectively the same technology. Okay? And each of the dots is a different processor. The color of the dot has to do with what year it was produced in. Now the black line, I don't have a So the black line over here is basically the time average of microprocessors. So initially, in, we started off with relatively low performance. We were able to increase performance relatively rapidly, well, rel with relatively low energy costs. We got to a point where that cost started increasing. We continued to increase performance over time until recently we realized energy efficiency is really what it takes. And as an ensemble, as an average, we've been basically trying to keep the performance high but decreasing the energy per operation. Everybody see, understand what's going on here? Okay. Now what's interesting here is this green line that I plotted. You can view as sort of an efficient frontier. Almost all the points are on this side of the line, and we can argue about some of these points down here, about why they're down there. But essentially, there seems to be a frontier that says, if I want this much performance, then you know, for a given technology, then it's going to take me this much energy for construction. So if I want to do energy efficient designs, I don't want to be up here. I want to be on this frontier, or I want to move the frontier. Make sense? So how do I figure out where the frontier is, and how do I figure out how to move it? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how do you figure out where the frontier is, and how do you get yourself on the frontier? And like everything, it's just an optimization problem. The question is, how do you formulate the optimization problem so you can solve it? So essentially what I want to do is I want to have, for a set of benchmark applications, I want to have a bunch of parameters that I can vary. And what I want to be able to do is understand which of these parameters, how I should set these parameters, such that at the end I get the best energy for a given level of performance. Now, we can, for the underlying circuits, create energy versus um, delay or performance trade-off curves. So we know if I run at a certain frequency what the energy of those individual things are. The hard problem is generally the fact that the, the architectural models that we have for what the performance is going to be are generally slow simulation models. So the problem is, typically the way we would do this is we'd have an architectural configuration, we'd run it through a simulator, it tell us what the performance is, we'd evaluate that, we'd figure out, oh, we should change this parameter, we'd come back around this loop and we do this loop. Anybody who's done architecture knows that you never want to be in this loop. Because this little box over here, the simulator, if you're simulating real applications, it takes hours, many hours, days sometimes to do that simulation. 
So you don't want to put that in the optimization. Instead, what we do is we basically take the simulator, we rent some time on Amazon or whatever compute farm you want, we just give it a whole bunch of random architectural parameters, we ask it to tell us what the performance would be, and we get a whole bunch of performance things, and if I want to sound impressive, I say I do statistical inference on the output data. If I want to be truthful and have people understand what I'm doing, I say curve fit. Right? And I create a model that basically matches the data points I've gotten. Now I have an analytic model, and what I can do is I can go through this design optimization loop much more quickly. Furthermore, I'm clever when I do this modeling, and I form those models into, I model it by using what are called convex functions, I make sure everything else in my design are convex functions. In the end, I get a very big convex function, and there are very efficient optimizers that can tell you what the optimal point of a set of convex constraints are. And so it will optimize, once you have formulated it this way, it will run this optimization in a few minutes. The net result of this is if you have the underlying data, you can go quickly generate plots like, like, that look like this. This was for a microprocessor and a 90 nanometer technology. And it gave you the sweep for a dual issue out of order machine what the overall performance is. Now, I'm not claiming this is the right transfer, this is the right thing, this was a student, we didn't have all the data that these companies have, but the method methodology works well. And the next thing it does is it can tell you for different points in this trade off curve, you know, what are you setting the cycle times to be, how big you should resource the caches, um, how big the instruction windows, various, you know, processor like parameters. Now, not only can you do it for one architecture and out-of-order machine, but you can do it for a single-issue in-order machine, a dual-issue in-order machine. You can run the optimization many times. It doesn't take that much time. And generate the overall trade-off curve that shows you that for low performance, you want a simple machine, and as you get higher performance, you can use as you expect more Now, actually, this isn't quite right. And the reason it isn't quite right is because I've assumed all these machines are running at a fixed voltage. And we know that you can actually change VDD of a part and change both the energy, because it, the energy per op depends on VDD squared, but the delay also depends on VDD squared. And so if you put voltage scaling into this picture, you get a different looking picture, which is not as pretty. And it turns out that voltage scaling basically says that there are very few architectures that are useful or efficient. At the very highest performance, you actually get the wider out of order issue. But for most of the range, what you want to do is a dual issue either in-order machine at the low end or out-order machine here. Now again, I'm not claiming that's really the right answer, but I am showing you that you can do this optimization, and when you include voltage scaling, you basically get some very interesting results. Unfortunately, having done all this, we were hoping that we were going to publish a paper that said, gee, this is really the way you should design processors, and it's way better than what people design. But not surprisingly, engineers are pretty good at polishing balls. And so if you let them polish that ball over many years, they're going to find a pretty good point. OK, so the, this optimizer will do it much more efficiently with much lower energy, but it's really not going to move the ball a lot from the people at Intel and AMD who have been doing this already. So what's the net conclusion? The conclusion is you can do this joint optimization. It's not actually that complicated to do. Everybody should be doing it um, because it will dramatically decrease the amount of design time it takes to generate this. It's important to pick a good architecture, but it turns out when you do this optimization, what you find is not that there's one much better than what people are using, but there are a lot of really bad ones that you shouldn't use. And the big advantage of this tool is it allows you to the space to find those good architectural parameters very rapidly. But unfortunately, this is not going to solve the problem I once saw, which is to make computing much more energy efficient, because the entire range of adjustment here is battle factor two. Okay. So let's go back to the problem that we started with, which is we need to create a more efficient computing system. And optimization is not going to do it because we're already pretty close to a, the optimal frontier of today's processors. So the best way of saving energy is basically to be lazy. Okay? So I used to joke with my students that I'm not smart. I'm just very good at being lazy. And what I mean by that is I work really hard to find out ways of solving problems that require me to take much fewer steps than most people. And therefore, I don't have to work that hard because I'm not doing that many steps. So I use less energy than, than many people. And of course, everybody thinks I'm super quick. 
They think I have really high performance, but I don't really have high performance. I'm just really good at being lazy. Okay. I'm doing less work to solve the problems than most people are. And the whole trick there is to understand the problem well enough to know the way to analyze it that basically will give you the solution quickest. And the basic goal in computing is how do you do this? How do you be lazy? is you think about some characteristic that's special to the problem that you're trying to solve, and you fold the problem in that way that all of a sudden requires you less to do less computation. You specialize the hardware or the algorithm for the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay? I, I, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know already. So the question is, if this is true and energy efficiency is really the big problem, why aren't we doing this? The principal way of doing this would be building an ASIC an application specific processor. And the problem is that the number of ASIC starts that are being designed are actually falling over time. They're not rising. And the reason for that is shown in this plot. Today, to build a chip that is as complex as you would need that you build in a 45 nanometer technology costs you over $40 million in total non-recurring engineering costs. And if you ask a bunch of venture capitalists to give you $40 million, they're going to want to see a billion dollar market. And the truth is, there aren't that many billion dollar markets. Okay. So, to me, this is so frustrating. We are so close to having the perfect solution, and yet we're so far. We have a technology that today, even before we scale it, is nearly infinitely capable. I tell my friends that there is no problem that you could tell me or some of my buddies that we couldn't probably build a chip that would solve it for you in your requirements. The problem is, you'd have to pay me $40 million to get the team of people that I would need to do this and generate the software, and there's no way to do the thing that Okay? So in the end, the problem is that the design's just too expensive to do. And this reminds me of the situation that actually occurred in the early 80s. During that period of time, chips were done by chip companies, right? The number of chip designers was very limited. And people thought that there was all this great stuff that they could do in this technology, but they couldn't really do it because they weren't chip designers and they couldn't basically build chips. And during that period of time, we invented synthesis and place around. Okay, and that allowed the whole back end, the whole chip design part of the business to go away. Not go away, we still curse at it today, but it's very different than it was. And it, and it created the ASIC business. And now what's happened is the complexity of the systems that we can build are so large that again, we can't afford to do design anymore. Not because of the back end, but rather because of the design complexity of the systems we need to build. So we need a new design innovation. So what is it that we want? And I thought about it a lot because I've been stupid enough to build a couple of very complicated chips at a university, so I didn't have huge design teams. Um, and I thought every time I did one of these designs, I really started wanted to work at the architectural level, and I wanted to basically um, not have to invent everything and build everything over again, which is what I do today. So I really want to have an architectural description, like a simulator model with a lot of parameters, like I talked about before. I'd like to be able to then put those parameters into an architectural template. So the template would provide me both the run times that I needed, the compilers that I needed for my code for that system, and the simulators I needed to evaluate that so I could basically play around with it to figure out what was good. And in the end, I wanted that, that those set of parameters to basically be able to cr create the system that I wanted. Now, maybe I would need to add a unique block in there, so I'd add a block and modify the simulator a little bit. But there's a ton of stuff that I don't necessarily want to modify every time I want to play around. Okay, another way of viewing this is that what I really start out with is I start out with some code that I want to I want to run, and I have again some architectural parameters for this template. I would like to be able to use that hardware optimization with an energy budget that I talked about before that my student Omid Azizi did. Combine that with a simulator, be able to come out with basically power due performance and energy <coughs> information, then optimize both the code that I'm working on and the architectural parameters stay at that high level of design. And when I get everything that I like, be able to change this around and take those same parameters and generate the RTL. And since I, I don't believe in 
bug-free software. I don't want it to generate the RTL with for me. I also want it to generate the validation script so I can run that to make sure that it works. <laughs> to enable this dream, I think really requires us to rethink design. Today, every designer evaluates a set of trade-offs and then creates the solution to a set of questions. That's wrong. That leaves the next person with no flexibility, you know, and then we hope the next person is going to use that block. That block has no flexibility. It isn't exactly what I want. What instead I would want them to do is to incorporate the knowledge they had for how they chose what the right design is into the design itself. So if my objectives were slightly different, it could rerun whatever those optimization scripts are internally and re-optimize those internal parameters. So basically, I want to turn the whole design process inside out. Today, the way we think about it is as a designer, I give you complete flexibility in the overall system, in the top level system, and I give you a bunch of blocks to put together. Instead, I want to do the opposite. I want to give you the system architecture, which is fixed, so I can give you the runtime, some of the software, and the simulator. But the components in that system are flexible or parameterized, so you can modify those parameters and basically generate the kinds of system that you want. Now, if I can accomplish this, I think everybody in this room would agree it would be a fantastic feat. I'm just not sure that anybody in this room believes I can accomplish that. So to try to test out some of these ideas, what we did is we took a design that we had done at Stanford University, which was called um, SMASH, the Stanford Smart Memory Chip. And we basically used that as a prototype of this configurable system. And fortunately for us, we had used 10 silica processors, which are configurable based processors, and we had built an extremely flexible memory system. And we started playing with it to see if one could, could build these kinds of generators and what kind of problems we'd run into. So essentially, we tried to answer four questions. The first question was, what's the potential benefit? That is, if I'm going to try to do some customization, you're not going to customize a piece of hardware for a factor of two. You're going to customize a piece of hardware for much larger improvements. So what kind of improvements can you get, and why can you get those improvements? If we are going to build these squishy components, how do you, how do you physically write them? Do you write them in Verilog? Do you write them in System Verilog? What's a way of writing something that can, that can um, contain both the hardware that you want as well as some of the optimizations that you would like to run to create that hardware. What are some ge general optimization techniques? And I've already talked about those earlier. That was the stuff that Oma did, so I'm not going to describe that further. And finally, everybody knows as you make things more flexible, they become harder to validate. And isn't validation the hardest problem anyhow? So aren't you like crazy for trying to do this? And I'm just going to, I don't have very much time left. I'm just going to touch on some of those things relatively quickly. Everybody with me? Okay. So what's the benefit of a chip generator? As I said, we would like to have large potential benefits because if we don't, it's not worth it. And then the other question is, can we generalize from these benefits? So over what range of computation can we apply whatever we're going to build? We try to answer this question by looking at H.264, which is a video compressor. The reason we chose this is because, A, it's widely deployed, so we could see what hardware designers did with this. There's also software that was built, so we can compare the hardware and software. Um, and it also had a variety of different computation. So I just want to point out here, in H.264, there's a bunch of different stages. If you look at the stages, what you what plotted here is the ratio of energy and performance that you get if you ran it in an ASIC versus running it on software. And what you notice is for some of these computations, there are almost three orders of magnitude loss by doing it in software. That is, it takes you almost a thousand times more energy to do this by running a program on a general purpose thing than it did by running it on an ASIC. Okay. So the first thing we did is said, okay, well, these are very data parallel things. Let's use all the ideas for data parallelism. So we built wide execution engines, everything that we thought that we could do would make it more efficient. And in fact, it did. Um, if you look, this, the blue bars are the initial implementation. The green bars are what you get in energy efficiency, or the amount of energy it takes to compute this. 
and you save an order of magnitude in the very parallel things in a factor of three or four in another stage. In that, which is the entry encoder, it's not parallel at all, it doesn't, doesn't save anything. So that's good, but the problem is you're still two orders of magnitude away from what an ASIC can do. Okay, and the fundamental problem here is the, the computations you're doing are eight inch or 16-bit integer operations. They're almost no energy. You're spending all your energy moving data into those units and out of those units, and that's just tremendous overhead. So you have to start over and have a different idea. And so the idea is to build what we call magic instructions. These are to build merge, storage, and logic units. So the data that you're computing on is actually local within the computational units, so you're never doing a register fetch. And in particular, in these kinds of operations, they have a large amount of data locality, so that the data you needed to compute this output is nearly the same as the data you need to compute the next output. Okay? When you can take advantage of that, you end up basically lowering, and we ripped out all the data parallel stuff, so you lower the energy by a factor of, uh, I think like 200 for the initial software thing, so you're within a factor of three in energy efficiency of the resulting machine. So what it says is, if you do customize the hardware, there is very large potential gains. Those potential gains happen for those computations that are intrinsically low energy. Said a different way, if all your energy is being taken by going out to memory because you have random access patterns, there's not too much you need to do or worry about because that energy is going to exist anyhow. Or said differently, you have to optimize to get rid of those fetches. If your fundamental computation that you want is very low energy, then there's potential gains, large potential gains by customization. Okay, if we want to do customization, how do you physically write that customization? That is, how do I write a module that not only has hardware in it, but can generate the right hardware that you want? And what we basically decided is that every piece of hardware is actually the combination of a piece of hardware and a program. That is, the program runs the local knowledge or optimization scripts. It does the constraint satisfaction between possibly different units within that. That can also instantiate other programmable. The hard thing is actually to get a system, not that you can write something that's, that's flexible, people have done that already, Tetsilka has one. The big question is how do you allow people to composite multiple flexible things into a bigger flexible thing? And so we created uh, a basically a prototyping language to do that, which we call uh, Genesis 2. And we are now using it and have built a prototype multiprocessor generator to get that done. So do I think this is exactly the right answer? No. But do I think this basically is a step in the right direction? Yes. We need to have the ability for a piece of hardware not just to specify what the hardware is, but to specify what hardware you should generate for various parameters that come into it. And that means that when you put a bunch of these blocks together, you need to also associate a program that says how you optimize the low-level blocks for the objectives of the top-level block. Um, and again, that's moving forward and looking pretty promising. Now let me end by just saying what I think many people think is the hardest problem, which is validation. So let's assume I built the system. How am I going to tell that the system really works? And again, I don't believe in correct by construction, mostly because all software I've ever run into has bugs in it. And if, you, if the generator has a bug in it, I want to be able to test it before I wait um, three months and spend uh, $5 million. So one of the things that we realized is that if you're going to build a generator, you can't do validation quite the way that we think about it today. Because generally, when you do validation, you build something called a scoreboard, or this is often called a golden model. So what you want to be able to do is apply stimulus to both the thing you're trying to validate and the golden model, and be able to break the outputs and see if they're the same. If I'm generating something, the actual implementation may vary, and therefore, what the actual answer in might be hard to determine. So instead, what you want to do is what we call a silver model or a relaxed scoreboard. So we're not going to necessarily be able to tell you what the one right answer is, but we're going to be able to tell you what the answer is within a set of possible answers. It turns out building these kinds of models is much easier than building that model, and you can build this model for a parameterized function, because this function says, I want to do multiplication, or I want to do routing, and that has some constraints. And so we can say the output has to be one of the possible valid outputs, beside ordering. 
And we used this in, the, in our multiprocessor design, and it was very efficient. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you is actually a surprising result that we ran into in a design we recently did. Since everybody thinks that validation is harder when you have flexibility, we were surprised to find that we built this very flexible unit, and the unit came back that we didn't find any bugs. And then we looked over some of the tests that we did because we kept the bug log. And what we realized is that because we had all these different configurations, so what's on the x-axis are different configurations of the machine, how we configured it. Um, and what we then did is for each of these configurations, we ran a test 250 times, and we marked down the number of times it failed that test. And you notice that many of the configurations never failed. Some configuration failed only once, right? But there are some other configurations that failed a higher number of times. And what we, when we look back at our bug database, some of the bugs were found in certain configurations, and other bugs were found in different configurations. We ran one standard configuration initially, and it found most of the bugs, because that's the first thing we ran. But there are bugs that we never would have found in that configuration that we only found in these other configurations. And then you th think about it from a validation perspective, this makes sense. One of the keys in validation is to add randomness. As we change some of the parameterization, it changes the ordering of events in the internals of the machine, causes the machine to explore different spaces. So basically, by having a generator, you can aid validation by building tweaks of what you're going to build around it and running validation there as well, and that's likely to find cases that would be that would be less frequent. In some of those cases, they'll become more frequent. And so the net result is that we actually think generators might help in validation because you have the ability to add more randomness into the design. So I think I'm running out of time, so let me just conclude here by saying that the technology engine that we have relied on for the past 30 years is no longer going to drive us for the next 20. And the big problem with technology scaling today is that energy efficiency is not scaling as fast as under, underlying capability is. This is going to force us to do two things. It's going to force us to enable efficient application creation. And I mean by this two things. One is we need to reduce the design cost to create solutions, but we also need to be able to create efficient solutions. And I think to do both of those things are going to force us to rethink the way we think about design. We need to basically stop designing things and design things that generate things. The standard software at a level of indirection. And I think we need to do that both for the fundamental silicon that we produce, but we also need to do that at the next level up to enable a much larger group of people to take advantage of the embedded system, the power of the embedded systems that we're building today to basically solve the problems that they need. Thank you all for your attention.